It was the beginning of pirate radio that we went to a pub one night. We used to go for a drink before dinner. And uh, we went to the pub and we were discussing with friends. And he said, there you are, darling. Now you've got your own island. What do you think of that? And I said, well, I'd like my own flag and a few palm trees. But they all discussed it. They all went home for coffee. But uh, Roy went home and started digging out what uh, law books he could find at home to see if there was a reason why we couldn't do it. And he couldn't find a reason. And he went to his lawyer and he said, no, he said, I can't find any reason, but boy, I'm sure you can't do it. You'll like, get, end up in the Tower, of, locked up in the Tower of London. Well, the main thing was to prove our independence from Britain. And uh, <clears throat> it shouldn't have been that difficult, really, because uh, what with Ireland and, uh, and the empire they had, they, they were well used to claims of independence being put against them on different areas. And so, Though they talked pretty wildly at times, they didn't do anything, and uh, they virtually accepted what we were doing. There were times when I thought, oh, I could do without this, but if he came to me and said, shall we give it up, I used to say no, because I knew he didn't want to. And I, I, I volunteered to help him in Zealand because uh, I wanted him to succeed. Really. I have to say, people were always very nice to me. I think, um, as one person said, uh, he said he could understand why doing it, but he couldn't understand me doing it. Um, I didn't bother to explain my reasons, but um, people in general were always very, and still are, very nice to me. Yes. No I seem to have inherited a few enemies around the place, but part of it was also uh, some people, there seemed to be a, a great feeling if we could do this there. There should be other places in the world that people wanted to do it, but they couldn't find them. No, they say it will never be done again. It's been yeah. done once and it can never ever be done again anywhere yeah. in the world because yeah. they've closed up all, all the gaps. I don't think that anybody can make things difficult for us now because, uh, you know, if they didn't want us to land in England, we could land in France or Germany or in Scandinavia. Everybody wants... Is, is, extraordinarily friendly to what we've done now and uh, and help including the English you know one of the things is a, a, a free a freedom area to have a, ho a, a hotel or hostel or even people living there in a, in a, in a freedom area where they're free from taxes and uh, free from financial controls unnecessary financial controls and, uh, and what more can you say I mean business is there wouldn't be liable for tax, <coughs> except any uh, 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 agreement they made with us. That's what, it's anything that is internationally free trading and uh, which comes on the broad ground. And uh, we do get propositions to raise land around the set to, to hold uh, 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 free country and which is free trading, but uh, so far we've almost turned these propositions down because we felt that, that period that we were a little young, the country was a little young and not established well enough to do that uh, successfully. The state was soon officially set up, declared a principality to the international community of states and began to function as the country which indeed it was. Living conditions aboard improved, tendering arrangements for food, fuel and other essential supplies were also made secure and there were plans to turn the venture into a European free trade zone. Sealand even produced its own postage stamps, passports and coinage. There was even a marriage ceremony on the Principality. Although the fortress has been constantly manned since 1967, several takeover bids have been launched against Sealand since its inception, one of them particularly violent and involved the kidnap of Roy's son Michael. Prince Regent Michael Bates, who is now the head of state of the Principality, explains what happened. We had some trouble with a few Germans in 1978. Um, my parents were in Austria uh, for a meeting with some business associates. Uh, but the same people decided they would, they would invade while they were there. And then, it was a German tax consultant who I'd met who I knew. 
and uh, wanted to land, and we wouldn't, I wouldn't let him land. I was doing my own, we'll see then. So he came down on a winch wire, and they had a, a camera crew filming him from the helicopter. And then another guy came down, and he had, he had a, a telex saying that my father had asked that they should be allowed to stay there, and you know, one thing or the other. I uh, was in the, the living room, which at the time I needed a tiny, small porthole. Now it's got big double glazed windows. And um, the door got slammed, and one of the camera crews stuck a tripod to the door handle, and I was locked in a steel room for about three or four days. I was feet tied together, knees tied together, elbows, hands. And my dad got back home for the next few, the next few hours, next day from Austria, because he got an inkling of what was going on. So uh, we found a friend of ours, we had a helicopter company at South Airport, took the doors of the helicopter and tied ropes on them on the back of the seats in the airplane. As we flew towards the fort, it was just breaking daylight. The first thing that there was, I could see a guy on deck uh, sleeping in a chair. And he told me afterwards, the first thing he saw was a helicopter appear from underneath the platform and put it the above the top. And, and we were standing outside at the time, on the back on the skids that came in and uh, slid down ropes on the top. Even though internationally Sealand is known and recognised as an independent country and a legitimate principality, the British government still refused to recognise Sealand's sovereignty or even its existence, in spite of the latest UK Ordnance Survey tourist map labelling it otherwise. Leaving Harwich by speedboat, we went to discover exactly what it's like to live and work in Sealand in 2003. Well, you're going up the highs, aren't you? One of the engineers in Sealand at the time of our visit was Michael Barrington. He showed us around the fortress. Well, here we are on the Principality of Sealand in the kitchen, or if you're more nautically inclined, the galley. And as you can see, it's quite spartan. Uh, the conditions on here are quite good. There's cookers, there's fridges, there's everything that you would need to live, eat and survive here. Here's Michael, who's at the moment the resident engineer on the Principality. He's been involved as an engineer out here for about, around about 15 years now. Michael, is there any chance we could just have a further look around the fortress? Yes, certainly, if you'd like to follow me. Thank you very much. Have a look. And so, the living room. Again, everything that you would expect at home. Comfy chairs, settee, pictures on the wall. There's even a telescope over there. And quite simply, a shower room with a toilet and a sink, just to keep yourself clean I suppose, it's just simple, basic living. And finally on this level, the upper deck level, on the fortress, is the state office rooms where you'll find telecommunications equipment and other essentials that are absolutely necessary in the running of a principality such as this. Well here we are on the first level in the north leg. Nothing much to say about this area really apart from the fact it's really just a landing. So shall we have a look down and see what's a layer below? <laughs> 